everybody reporting to you again from the glamour city Hollywood. But the actual proposition of, of the activist leader is that if you are not as a leader on these issues, you're not actually running things in the way they need to be run for tomorrow. So you may not want to be a leader on climate change or a leader on rages, but you do need to lead a company that is resilient in the face of climate change or, or unstable populations. So it, there's a halfway house and it's your judgment as a leader where you're playing. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Lucy Parker, co-author of The Activist Leader, A New Mindset for Doing Business. Welcome to the show today. Delighted to be here. Thank you for asking me to come. Lucy, you have a very interesting background. You started as a BBC documentary maker, which in itself is fascinating. Now, at some point, you chair the UK Prime Minister's Task Force for Talent and Enterprise for Gordon Brown. And of course, uh, for decades, you've been an advisor and coach to many executives around the world. And now you run an organization called Business and Society. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes. <laughs> um, the current things that fill my days, Business and Society, I'm leading uh, the piece of the firm Brunswick, which is a global advisory firm on critical issues and critical stakeholders. And of course, one of the critical issues for business leaders today is how they deal with all the pressures that are coming from society. There are many, many issues on radar screen in business life today that were not thought of as business issues before. And so how do companies step up to that big social challenge that they find themselves in today is the heartland of what I do now. Well, if you wind the clock back, as you say, to beginning as a documentary producer, what are you doing in documentaries but telling the story about the way the world is going? So they can look like many different threads of life, but actually by the time you've been in documentary making, which is to try and grapple with and understand the big trends in the world and make it easy to explain them to people, then find yourself doing it in government. And then you find yourself with business leaders again and again who are trying to explain what they want to do with their company. It's almost a natural conclusion that you would say, where is the intersection of these trends? Now, just to uh, put a little bit of backdrop for those listeners to give a little bit of um, relevancy and understanding what we're talking about is, it used to be that if you were CEO of a large corporation, you focus on the business model, the strategy, yeah. the products, the service, and of course, the earnings report and the quarterly uh, metrics that you're measured against. But now they're measured against something else. Things, what they say, the perspectives are things that they share around, let's say, what's happening in Palestine and Israel. Uh, things around, let's say, sexuality or sexual orientation or things around ESG, let's say. We become a very polarized society, not just in America, but really around the world. And as not only globalization, but hyperpolarization, and these political aspects, these fringe of extremes from left and right start to come into these thematic narratives into private sector that really we don't think that have a place per se, but it does. In fact, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the example of but, but Light and Target in a few minutes, but what does that all mean and what does it mean to be an activist leader? You've put a marvellous handful of questions on the table in one go. So let's see if we can just pick up what's at the essence of that. I completely agree with you. It used to be really clear you were expected to deliver financial performance. That had to do with everything in the immediate next quarterly results, but also a way ahead. And it was pretty clear, too, if you were a listed company, you needed to produce a thing that you sold to customers or to clients. And you took that money and a big chunk of it went to shareholders, and then you went around the other way and you did it again. A very straightforward process. It isn't instead of that now. One of the big challenges for business leaders is they still have to do that. But most business leaders who are in strong positions today grew up learning to do that. 
They've been measured on it for a long time. They know how to do it. The new demand is you have to do financial value at the same time as social value. That is really new. And you could say then, well, so why is that the case? And I think the big issues that companies are being asked to respond to in the societal arena are because those things have become business issues. Societal questions have become business questions because of the way those trends push in on society. It's easy to see in the environmental arena. There is no company around the world that hasn't in some way or another got to think its position on carbon. They may think lots of different things about carbon, but with the world's concern about climate change, there is no way that as a leader of a company today, you're not thinking about where do I stand on that question. So that question is about what that issue is to your business and what your business is to that issue. And it becomes a business critical business case in Europe just this summer, which was the hottest summer in Europe for ever. There was an energy company in southern Italy that literally stopped everything in the company stopped. And the cost of getting back out of that breakdown in service, as you can imagine, they had to call in the army, goodness knows what else. What had happened? Their cables had melted underground. They didn't work anymore. You talk to those business leaders and they go, we should have seen it coming. When you look at the climate change questions around the world, what you're seeing business leaders say is, we, we need to see this coming. And that is the trend in the outside world pushing its way into how you run the business. And there's a business case for that. So, so, that's so, let, why so let me pause you for a second, because <laughs> climate change is something that I think universally there is an acceptance and understanding that has a permutation and implication to everything from private to public to just our, our livelihood and future generations. So no, no, no questions there, but other societal issues that have questionable impact. And, and so, so let's take the example of the recent issues around universities, Harvard, MIT, UPenn, where some of the presidents have been under pressure for not even what they said per se, but maybe what they didn't say or the way they didn't say it enough yes. around the conflict in, in the Middle East and how they've been pressured to have to resign and, and some of the board members have to step down as well. So at what point on from a societal topic or issues should have a material impact to corporations? Yes. Well, the, the, the thing I was aiming to be saying with the carbon thing, to just stay yeah. there for one moment longer, is it's clear if you run a business that it's to do with your operations. Actually, when you say there's no question there, a lot of the leaders under pressure are under pressure there. There are people in, beyond the business going, I don't know why you do this. The people who succeed in this arena make the case for how it links. The people who get in trouble are very often drawn into what is in fact a political debate. It's not a business debate. And certainly with a lot of companies I work with, the key is for companies to get very good and business leaders to get very good. And is this really something whereby raising our voice, we're making a difference to the issue or we're making a difference to our immediate and critical stakeholders? And if not, why would we be talking about it? And where people often trip up is that the political debate literally pulls you off balance, off running the business, into being fodder for fuel for a, for a public debate that's way beyond the company. And because those boundaries are, are, are blurred and because the issues come thick and fast all the time, the most common thing I hear from business leaders is, I don't know where the next one's coming from. Mm -hmm. But in fact, a lot of the questions, the ones you raised in the universities, are identity questions. And anybody running large teams of people today, even small teams of people, know that one of the crucial things is that the questions around people's identity are, are very, very high priority to your own people. People want different things from work today. They turn up and they want recognition of their identity and work in a way a generation they never did, a generation ago they never did. So business leaders have to understand that that is a direct relationship between them and their employees and their supply base and so on. But where they trip up is where they try to speak up. You often hear speak up on issues that are not actually to do with the business, but they take to heart this pressure to say more than is what is business essential. And they trip up.
And now it's not an easy judgment to make, but whenever you see it go wrong, that's what's happened. They've gone further than what you made as an obvious story about climate. In fact, it's lots of people tangle on, on, the, on the carbon one. You'd think there'd be no argument. But apparently there is. And a lot of business leaders get beaten up for pushing too much investment towards that. You should be dealing with short-term profits. And that's very often a different perspective about what makes for long-term sustainable profitability versus what makes for next quarter or year's results. Mm -hmm. So even in those things that are apparently obvious because the pressure of the issue is so clear, business leaders are having to deal with the fact that they are caught between short-term profitability and long-term sustainable profits. And that's where, the, that's where those issues really show up. And to me, that's almost a different debate from the political arena, left or right, or geopolitics, wants you to step into it and speak up because the, everybody wants everybody's noise today. But mostly I work with companies, you go pull back. And let, is that really yours to say? Is that really yours to add to? So, so, let me, it's so fraught, you mostly yeah. don't win. You never win in those debates. So, so let, let's get into some of the nuances because that it, it's a, it's a lot for these uh, these organizations to have to evaluate that out and determine what issues to actually tackle. And if they do decide to take an approach to it, what is the degree and and the and the approach and how they actually say it and and do it. There is a lot of nuances here. Uh, yes. let's, take the, let's take the example of Bud Light and Target. Okay. What what happened to some of these companies and how could they have managed it better? Well, I think that's I think again, that's a very interesting um question. And we're, we're not getting into the details of those because actually that isn't where the answer is. I think there's a difference between companies that use these kinds of questions in their marketing. That is really really high risk because you're usually where there what a company is doing is that is they're talking to a particular customer segment or consumer segment that's and that's very easy to trip up because that's just one segment of the population and they're saying they're hugely attached to a particular segment of the population or a particular group that wants something from them and they're missing the point that that is one segment amongst many in the tested arena and if they're serious about operating in a noisy contested arena, they need to pick where they choose to put their voice. So it's another instance of, did you need to do that? Because you're speaking to a segment of a population, which is now showing up in a world where every segment will fight against each other. Mostly, it's a high risk thing to take a big issue and land it in one corner of your business. Mostly what's being asked is corporate behavior, which is why you can have on one hand a, a dean of a, an academic institution and on another an advert in a consumer facing business. Those are people or that try to harness societal issues into a little piece of their story. The thing that we're writing about in Activist Leader is actually the big issues in the world that have become business issues are where the externalities of your business need attending to climate is one interestingly living wage is another and very controversial one you know these are things where your business operating model is actually throwing off an externality where you're expecting society to pick up the tab in one way or another so business models that go we're paying below the living wage that's a high cost on society either to those individuals or to the people who have to pick up the fact that you can't live on a below living wage but it's part of the business model that your results will deliver profitability because the wages are at that level. You could be a huge manufacturing plant, but you're not pricing in carbon. So somebody else is coping with the cost of carbon. So the activist leader is about really recognizing that the issues that in society that press on your radar screen as a corporate are the ones where you probably are throwing off part of the problem and you look at the problem differently, you walk towards it, and you start to become part of the solution instead of exclusively part of the problem. So let's let's go through an example. And again, I know our time is very limited, but let's take the example of artificial intelligence. Uh, in yes. Particularly as we speak right now, generative artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is the, the topic that everybody is 
is it's you know can't get away from and, yes. and certainly it is very much tied to corporations operating efficiency and we're already starting to see continual um reduction in workforce and layoffs right and in some cases there's outright replacement of humans with ai in the case of let's say google for instance replacing some of their advertising i think some 10 or 20,000 people with ai capabilities so there is definitely a business case for it but there is also implications as well including mm. retraining uh, yes. the workforce because just taking a big step back is that it's not an issue of the fact that we haven't had technology technology has always been part of humanity the issue is that we've used to have time to adjust to technology including learning new trade new education new industries that people can find themselves opportunities into but the exponential growth of new technologies and ai is just one of many is getting so steep that the changes are happening so quickly but the humans we cannot adjust fast enough and the policies and the programs that are out there isn't sufficient to support that yes so what so in using this as an example model how should executives and and leaders deal with this from a activist perspective such a great it's such a great question so i think that part of the point really is sounds straightforward is seeing the problem because most business leaders are going, I'm running my business, it's working well, I'm selling more, I'm cutting costs, I'm taking people out, it's all fine. But actually, the activism is to go, this is going to throw off a lot of challenges in the future. Let's look at those now and let's engage on them. And typically, the three areas where businesses operate brilliantly when they start to get to grips with these things is what can you do in your own business? So the phrase you used, retraining is very important. What you're starting to see in engineering firms, for example, is it used to be, well, we'll just get rid of these people, they don't have the skills. And you suddenly go out to the marketplace, there aren't other people with those skills, you've got to train them. And so increasingly, see business leaders go actually part of our operating model, part of our costs, part of the way we function as a business is to retrain inside the business. You don't just throw people out and then look for others and that's expensive to us and expensive to them. So you work out what is it inside the business you can do. And then you work out beyond the business, who's really concerned about this? Who are the NGOs? Who are the policymakers? Where are the think tanks? Where are the academics? Where are the grassroots groups grappling with this stuff? And you go and partner with them on new solutions. And the third thing you do, which is absolutely fascinating when you see it in, in strong companies dealing with these kinds of questions, is they start to become advocates for the enabling conditions to start grappling with this problem system wide. So if, in my view, if you started to look at what really differentiates leading companies today in this space, is they actually drive for systems change. They don't just drive for better performance for their company. So to give you an example, um, Maersk is an example we use in the book, one of the biggest shipping companies in the world. And they were dealing with what we were mentioning a moment ago, the fact that they've committed themselves to net zero carbon is a big question for the shipping industry. And yet you couldn't move the industry at all because there are no ships that run on green fuel to shorthand it because there's no green fuel, not enough supply. And there's no supply of green fuel because there's no ships. Nobody knows where to start. And they just came out of their corner and said, we've got to start. And they commissioned eight ships to run on green hydrogen. When you've done that, you've actually start to go, well, we haven't got enough. So who can we partner with beyond the business to scale that up? So they designed eight new ships. They found it was working mm -hmm. like mad. They scaled via the partners with uh, supply and then they realize actually that's very costly for the business so who's going to underwrite that they start getting the contracts in the future their customers who say if you produce those ships we'll pay the premium to put our stuff on those ships because our customers in the consumer space care about it they started to actually break the deadlock by walking towards the problem gripping it coming up with the first iteration of ideas and innovation themselves then bringing others in to get to other parts of the system so they work in the business, they work beyond the business. And then crucially, they started to go, you policymakers, you need to create the conditions that the whole industry can move. Where is the industry body that will coalesce around this and drive 
future progress. And it's a massively innovative thing to do. So what it's doing is deploying the innovative capability of the business towards the question that is a societal need and a business need. And it's always the same formula. So I love this example of of the, the the shipping container and how they've actually taken the leadership to create and support green hydrogen, hydrogen e- ecosystem to specifically create a systems change. Now, with that said, of course, the other side of it is many leaders are going to say, well, that is high risk, high capex and high opex with high risk and uncertain outcomes. And as we know, most corporations are not true leaders in that sense from an industry point of view. There are followers. They are perfectly happy at being at parity rather than taking the incremental new thing to change the entire systems thinking and architecture. What do we do with the majority? Well, there are lots of ways. I mean, partly the reason we wrote The Activist Leader is that most businesses do actually have to start going, we better start thinking about this. It, you're not just a leader, not a leader, you're a laggard if you're not thinking about it, which is why I gave the example of the Italian company. They literally went, we should have been thinking about it. So a lot of people go, I don't want to be the leader, but you're now becoming a laggard if you're not on these questions. And I think what you start to see in systems change now is that there's a coalition of of a system around almost every issue. So what you see is that businesses that don't want to be the instigator come in via a coalition. In the old days, coalitions used to be kind of rather grand and people signed things and went away and did other other, other activities. But these innovative activist coalitions are people that organizations across the system that come together to get something changed. So you see that in wages in the apparel sector. You know, one company can't change wages in the emerging markets um, for for a whole population. But you bring together the industry, not just the manufacturers, but the suppliers and everybody behind them. You can start to swarm a problem. There's usually instigators in there, but others can join in and contribute into such a thing. But the actual proposition of, of the activist leader is that if you are not as a leader on these issues, you're not actually running things in the way they need to be run for tomorrow. So you may not want to be a leader on climate change or a leader on wages, but you do need to lead a company that is resilient in the face of climate change or or unstable populations. So there's a halfway house and it's your judgment as a leader where you're playing. Yeah, it's... um... Again, I'm in full agreement with you. I think the, the the realist in me keeps coming back up is that as much as cognitively a lot of these leaders of, let's say, Fortune 500 or even 2,000 companies around the world recognize this, the reality on the ground pragmatically is they're not going to take that leadership role. They will hang tight, pull back, wait on the sidelines until there's enough of a momentum right, industry momentum or others in terms of volume and size before they start to think about we should do this too. And again, um, they may not admit it, but they are perfectly happy being laggers. Yes, I think that's I think that it, that's a reality, which is what, what led us to write the book. And one of the reasons people are laggards is they don't know how. I mean, literally every time I meet a business leader and they start to see these new demands, almost before I don't want to lead is so given I've been working in this field for 10, 12 more years, actually, we started to go, you know, it's not a mystery how. You, you, there are practical things you can do. And it's really fascinating that 10 years ago, companies used to go, well, we're acting within the law. So I, I think we're fine, aren't we? And to the point you began with, there's a noise and a pressure from outside world dialogue now. People are starting to see, people who lead companies are starting to see that the pressure to go further than just the regulatory baseline is very, very high. So you take something like waste, take an area like waste. There's lots of countries in the world where you don't have to do much about it. Regulation didn't bother. But there's other places in the world where the regulation is really coming in quickly and you'd better be able to answer in those jurisdictions what you're doing. And the innovation that starts to come in to meet that standard pulls the whole thing up. 
So if you take something as watermarking in, in, in waste management or new materials in waste management, people finding new forms of plastic, finding new forms of packaging, new sources of, of non-fossil fuel created uh, plastic and so forth, that's a company putting its innovation into action to solve a problem. Once it's done that, what you actually see, which is fascinating, is they start to see that they are leading their marketplace, their customers, their consumers, and they're making it very hard for other companies not to follow. Investors start to turn around and say, they seem to have cracked that problem. You're not doing it. And also, once the innovation has been created, you've established, you've raised the baseline for everybody. So even the few that are actually genuine leaders, I mean, we know in the world not most people, most companies, most organizations aren't leaders, but the ones that do lift the bar. And there are plenty of signals for people who want to be in the pack to watch where that's going, start working alongside them, start contributing their products in. They're fascinating hidden things. One of the examples we give in the book in a small way is toilets. Quietly, while we've all not particularly been looking, the people who manufacture toilets are using less and less and less water for every flush. Why? Because they're realizing water is one of those big issues that actually means we're going to have to use resources differently. So their engineering departments are constantly ratcheting up. How do you manage this thing, which is going to be a resource problem a few years down the line? And we solve it before the regulator. We solve it before the customer even knows to ask us because we can see the trajectory. Fishing, fishing industries, they're starting to know that they've actually taken all the fish out of the ocean. You don't need to wait for the regulator. You don't need to wait for the customer to be prepared to pay more. You know that the way you're fishing is stripping the oceans. So what are you as a business leader doing about that long-term business problem? So a lot of this is actually taking on board the understanding of the forces operating around your business and acting towards it as any business leader would. You don't have to grandstand that you've taken on a societal issue. You're understanding the implication of that issue for your business. And then you're playing in your innovative capability. So my last final question is going to be around this um, this uh, theme around the fact that over the last several years, about three years or so, a lot of companies have really jumped on the bandwagon of greenwashing or mm. ESG, sustainability, what have you. Mm. But over the last year or so, we've started to see lawsuits because mm. of the fact that, especially in Europe, where you actually have real carrots and sticks. Mm. And if you don't meet certain things that you say you're going to do around sustainability, there's actually penalties associated with it, including tariffs. So now you're starting to see leaders and companies kind of shirk back because of the fact that, wow, not only do we have to be careful what we say and claim, but there is a potential for a lawsuit. In this climate, in this kind of context, what would be your advice? My advice would be to go back to the soul of the idea of activism is an activist is somebody who recognizes the problem they're trying to solve, recognizes it's difficult and intractable, and goes for it anyway, knows that it's going to be difficult and they take it a step at a time. If you caricatured it in order to illustrate it, take that as an activist mindset. A corporate mindset, often, meaning you lock yourself inside your corporate imperative, is you take it at its minimum. You don't really keep going out to solve the problem. You do the minimum. And you go, well, that'll do. Now, one of the ways that shows up in claims companies make is they say something is sustainable in order to say we've done something good. And that's what gets them in trouble because they wanted to make the claim and they wanted to use the big word, but they slightly didn't look fully at the fact that it was an overclaim. An activist is much readier to go, this is a big problem. We've taken a step in this direction. The next step will be such and such, and we still haven't solved that. And it's not just you're less likely to make claims, but your actual attitude is likely to make greater progress. Mm -hmm. So where you see the greenwashing claims, it's people who kind of bought their own PR. You know, oh, we did this. We'll tell everybody it's sustainable. You know it's not sustainable. You took one step and you've overclaimed for it. So actually the activist mindset protects you because you actually start to acknowledge what it doesn't do and what the next thing is. Mm. And it, it 
prevents you from being the company that in an effort to be good rather than business focused has claimed too much. That is a terrific summary. And with that, I have been joined by Lucy Parker, co-author of The Activist Leader. Thanks for joining today. Thank you very much indeed. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.